Hello, uh, Year 12. I hope you all had a lovely break over the Easter holidays. I hope you're feeling a bit recharged and um, you got out in the beautiful sunny weather. Wasn't it incredible weather over the last um, over the last couple of weeks? Very, uh, very, very nice. Um, unseasonably hot, which we might have encouraged us to relate slightly to Blanche. Um, feeling uh feeling the heat of her new environment that she is struggling to settle into so much okay now today we're going to carry on um with our weekly lessons looking at one scene a week and i'm going to give you a writing task to do as well we're going to look at scene five today if you remember scene four ended with something of a victory for stanley because blanche to borrow a metaphor from the poker game the previous evening, you remember the disastrous poker game where Stanley ended up assaulting his pregnant wife. Blanche had put her cards on the table as far as Stanley was concerned. She told her sister Stella that she thought that her husband was little more than a Neanderthal. He was a, basically a caveman dressed up in human clothes. He uh, and that she'd made a disastrous mistake being with him. Stella replied that she was not in anything that she wanted to get out of. She's actually very happy with Stanley and being with Stanley. She then runs back into his arms and the scene ends with Stanley looking over Stella's shoulder at Blanche, very much the victor in this situation. Now, the crucial other thing that happened, of course, was that Stanley unbeknown to Stella and Blanche, Stanley overheard everything. He overheard all of the things that Blanche was saying and licked his lips almost like a predator now closing in on its prey. And safe to say that from this point onwards, Stanley's mission becomes about the destruction of Blanche. And we're going to see him start to go about that in the next scene. But I've put a quote here for you to think about going forward. Blanche is both a villain and a victim, the cause of her husband's suicide and the suffering widow as a result of it. Now, we've not got to Alan's suicide yet, but I thought this is an interesting idea to look at because the most interesting characters, I think, in any form of literature are complicated characters. If someone is a straight up villain or straight up victim and there's nothing else to them, it's not as interesting as if they're complex, right? And when a character has good and bad to them or when you can argue that they are both a villain and a victim it becomes so much more interesting in the way that you can you can talk about them and i think blanche really comes into that mold over the next uh, scene or so so again make sure before you watch this video make sure you have read scene five okay we're not doing a read along you should have read it and studied it beforehand and now i'm going to talk to you about some of the most important bits okay so, scene five opens with Blanche sort of merrily writing a letter to a man called Shep Huntley. We talked about Shep Huntley before, this man who may or may not exist, probably doesn't exist in the way Blanche thinks he does. Um, interestingly, he's called Shep, which you could say comes from the word shepherd. And of course, a shepherd's responsibility is to protect his or her sheep. So you could probably do quite a lot with that. But we'll come on to more of that later on. Blanche opens up the scene by saying to Stella, oh, I'm writing a letter to him and I'm laughing at what a liar I am. Such a liar, she says. And she's fabricating this whole scenario and basically asking Shep to come and sort of rescue her. And she, she lies about what's going on. She says, I'm attending a round of entertainments, teas, cocktails and luncheons. She paints her life in the way that she wants it to be. She, she sort of says to Shep that she needs, all of her friends have gone away, um, but she's been enjoying this amazing social calendar, but now her friends have gone away and she needs him to come and pick her up or to sort of send for her and save her. Then on to page 50, we hear an altercation between Steve and Eunice and Steve and Eunice are a sort of representation of perhaps the classic couple of the time right there's this crashing and banging steve says don't you throw that at me eunice shrieks back you hit me i'm gonna call the police and then we hear this sort of clattering and blanche in a moment which i think is meant to be kind of comedic blanche says brightly did he kill her and then eunice appears at the top of the steps in what's described as a demonic disorder so 
the violence of Stephen Eunice's relationship sort of starts to normalise how uh, men and women interact with each other in this part of New Orleans and in this sort of area of the class pyramid. Um, if indeed it is a pyramid, that's another thing you could explore. And we'll talk about more. But what you've uh, what you then see is Stanley say, oh, what's the matter with Eunice? Uh, Stella says she's had a row. Has she gone to the police? Stanley says, no, nah, she's getting a drink. And Stella replies, that's much more practical. And here we see the kind of pragmatism of New Orleans, right? They're, they're, oh, they've had a Barney. She's gone to get a drink. We'll be all right in a minute. Again, it all serves to isolate how much Blanche doesn't fit in to this, right? How much Blanche is at odds with this world. And it almost serves to normalise the violence of the night before, or sorry, a couple of nights ago in the poker night. It almost serves to show that this is all just very much run of the mill in New Orleans. And it's one of the many things that Blanche can't get her head around, how normal this kind of stuff is. Now, on 51, page 51, she again falls into this very patronising tone that so infuriates Stanley. She says, you know, I'm compiling a notebook of quaint little words and phrases I've picked up here. Now, she almost sounds like a sort of zoologist or something, doesn't she? She sounds like she's studying them as if they're kind of interesting animals. I'm keeping this little notebook of all the funny words and phrases that um, I've been hearing. Uh, I've been hearing since I've been here. And Stanley replies quite angrily. He says, you're not going to pick up anything here that you ain't heard before. He's angered by her tone. He's angered by this implication that they are so different, that they are somehow worthy of study to someone like Blanche. You know, how patronising that she would think, oh, I must write down these funny little things you say in my in my notebook. Then Stanley starts kind of slamming around because he's annoyed. Blanche says, what sign were you born under? And how it's interesting that Blanche is so interested in astrology because the astrology and the idea that the stars can tell us our fate is very, uh, it's kind of interesting at this point in the play because obviously if you put your belief in astrology, it suggests that our fates are out of our hands, that there's some greater force controlling us. Now, would Blanche like that idea or not? Would Blanche be excited by the idea that we are, that our fate is out of our hands or is she perhaps frightened that she's losing control, perhaps both of them? There's something you could make an argument before. But again, so patronising. She thinks that he's um, born under Ares, Ares, the god of war, um, and says, you know, oh, this banging around. You must have done lots of, uh, you must have had lots of banging around in the army. Now, bearing in mind, those, those men in the army, they put themselves and their lives in danger and they saw horrific things. And Blanche is talking about it as if it was almost like a childish game. Oh, you must have had lots of banging around in the army as if he's like a, a kid going off on sort of scout camp or something like that. And you can imagine how angry that would make someone like Stanley, you know, how condescended he feels, how patronised he feels, how she's infantil infanticising um, his fighting for his country, making it all like it's this kind of childish joke. And again, as I've said before, one of the most interesting arguments to make when you're talking about Blanche is how much does she know what she's doing? How much is she completely aware that she is um, winding him up and how much of it is done by accident? Again, arguments you could make either way. And it isn't necessarily about arriving at a conclusion. It's about exploring how, ten, uh, how Williams presents both of those ideas. Now, Stanley's going to start threatening and upsetting Blanche at this point because he says, oh, sorry, she says that her sign is Virgo, which is representative of the Virgin. And Stanley contemptuously says, ha. Now, it's only a single syllable. It's a typical monosyllabic utterance from Stanley. But there's so much in that little ha, because within that ha, we start to see that Stanley is building a greater understanding of, of Blanche. And what he's sort of saying is, ha. You're, you know, that's quite funny, the idea of you being a virgin. And then he says, do you happen to know somebody named Shaw? And Blanche looks very frightened. Now, Stanley's exercising a degree of control over her here, and he's using his network to show her 
that he is the one in this new America. He's the one with the control, not her with her posh family and her old money or the money's gone now. But you know what I mean? The status that came with that money. What makes him powerful is his network and his communication and his people. And he knows someone called Shaw. And straight away we get the feeling that is not comfortable with the idea that he knows somebody with that name. Because this person reckons they know her from a hotel called the Flamingo. Now we straight away get the impression that the Flamingo is not the kind of hotel where you want people to know you from. And she says, oh, it's not the kind of place I've ever been. But he says, Stanley says, but you know it though. And well, she says, yeah, I've seen it and I've smelled it. And he says, page 52 now. He says, you must have got pretty close if you could smell it. Now, all the time he's hinting, he's suggesting something here, isn't he? Right? I, I know something here. I know what's going on. And he says, oh, pretends not to be concerned. And he says, oh, you know, don't worry. I'm sure this guy, Shaw, has got you confused. So he's implying that whatever he's heard from his mate, Shaw, whatever this guy has told him, he said, that can't be true, Blanche. It can't be about you because this thing that I've been told is pretty bad. And you, surely that can't be you that I'm hearing about. Now, he's deliberately not telling her too much. Why is he not telling her too much? Because he wants her to worry, because he wants her to feel stressed out and scared about all of this stuff. Now, Steve and Eunice come back. Eunice is uh, sobbing luxuriously. Steve is cooing love words. Their, um, their relationship is back on track. It seems, you know, this kind of dysfunctional, tumultuous New Orleans relationship is back, back to sort of square one. And then Stanley and Stanley goes with them. Now, we see on page 53, Blanche have one of her panicky, frightened monologues. You know, lots of hyphens breaking up her speech, lots of um disjointed broken sentences and also lots of metaphor it's interesting that blanche falls back on metaphor when she's frightened when blanche gets scared she avoids reality and instead she hides in a world of kind of double meaning and metaphor look she says look i was never sufficient enough when i was in bell reefed and i'm a soft person when people are soft they have to court the favor of hard ones so she's implying that her softness meant that she had to look for heart protection from hard people and she had to presumably bargain to get that protection. Nice juxtaposition there between hard and soft, you could um, uh, explore what that means. Then she talks about you have to put on the colours, you have to make butterflies, to put on the soft colours of butterfly wings and glow, make a little temporary magic just in order to pay for one night shelter. Now, what she's implying, of course, is that she had to use her body to get by in the world. Her, her fortunes were so bad that she started having to rely on her, um, her body and sex as a way of getting by. And she says, Stella, from one leaky roof to another because it was a storm, all storm, and I was caught in the centre. Now, she's not saying anything explicit. She's not saying any of this stuff directly, but she's trying to confess perhaps in her own way by implying these things to Sela. She says, look, the world's a cruel place and a soft person, if you're a soft person, you have to shimmer and glow, put a paper lantern over the light. There's that fantastic metaphor again, saying that you have to hide from the direct glow of the light. And the interesting thing, I guess, about all of these metaphors, all of this colourful language that Blanche is using, what is kind of unsaid is that Stella doesn't really care. Stella doesn't sort of seem to mind. And Blanche is really kind of doing this all for herself, which is interesting because you sort of think, well, Stella and maybe Mitch to a certain degree, they might have accepted her for who she was if she'd only had the ability to be honest. But instead, once again, what we see here is Blanche breaking down and um, going on this rambly metaphor filled, oh, lights and butterflies and paper lanterns and all of this stuff, rather than saying anything directly. And perhaps because she tries to hide, she doesn't get anything really off her chest. She doesn't actually confess to anything um and stella basically just passes it all off and say you know stop being so silly you know all of this stuff down to the middle of page 54 is stella just trying to calm her sister down and say i'm not really worried 
about this stuff, Blanche. Then, bottom of 54, we have a fantastic metaphor. We have Stella pours a Coke and a shot, of course. Blanche is never going to have a Coke without a shot in it. Has this drink in her hand, but it spills, it foams over and it spills on her white skirt. And it, well, does it stain it? That's part of it. So, why is this such a powerful metaphor? This is the second half of page 54. The Coke, I think, is a symbol of the new America, industrialized. You know, Coke, huge, huge company, lots of factories and mass production, all the things that was meant to make this new America powerful, right? Coca-Cola is a brilliant symbol of that. And it stains her white dress. It stains her purity. This new America has left a stain on her. But look, I mean, you'll know if you've ever spilled Coke on a white garment, it leaves a stain, right? You're not going to spill Coke on yourself and not stain the garment. But Blanche says, not a bit, haha, <laughs> isn't that lucky? And here I think we see the denial that she can't even, she can't see the Coke stain on her dress in the same way she can't see the way that the new America is so much more powerful than she is. And also, perhaps to a lesser extent, she cannot see the stains or she cannot accept the stains that her past has left on her purity. Another couple of questions there. Is the stain her lost innocence that she refuses to see? Is it a reminder of her husband's bloody end? Perhaps that as well. All of these things you can explore. Now, another really important bit is about to happen, right? But before Mitch is taking her out for a date and Blanche on page 55, top of page 55, she talks to Stella a little bit and basically says that she has been holding back on sleeping with Mitch. He's not got anything more than a good night kiss. She's worried that man, uh, that men lose their interest once they've got what they want physically from a relationship. So she's holding back for this reason. Now, I think there's a heavy irony here that actually um, Mitch probably or maybe would have accepted Blanche if he knew the truth. But what Mitch eventually can't stand is the lies and the dishonesty. But here we see that she is being very dishonest with Mitch because she's had this past where she's had to use her body um, to get by all of this stuff. Now, you could be completely sympathetic about that and say, well, that's her as a victim. That's not her fault. She was put in a terrible situation. But the point is that it's the dishonesty about it that I think that Mitch finds so difficult to deal with. And the fact that she still pretends to have all these airs and graces and be this pure Southern Belle when she's not. It's not necessarily the fact that she did these things. It's that she creates this false persona. You see that on page 55. Now, another key moment in the play, the young man comes in and Interestingly, William shows us this moment of sort of sleaziness before he comes in. The, the Negro woman snaps her fingers before the young man's belt and then says something in his ear to which the young man shakes his head violently and edges up the steps. Now, what we see there is obviously this woman being really sleazy to this young man out in the street. And I think why Williams puts that there is for us to perhaps consider whether there's that much difference between her behaviour and what we see from Blanche next. Now, I'll come back to that in a minute. So he just tries to come in and sell her the paper. Blanche asks him in for a drink. And um, we get a bit of blue piano on page 57, you know, this kind of motif of New Orleans and the liveliness of it all, but also increasingly of Blanche's perhaps mental condition. Um, and she says, young man, young man, young man, repeating herself, right, stressing young. Has anyone ever told you you look like the young prince out of Arabian Nights? Now, I think that's a really interesting juxtaposition because the Negro woman snaps her fingers in front of his belt in this way that comes across as really inappropriate. Blanche says, oh, do you, you know you look like the young man from Arabian Nights? She talks about literature. But interestingly, it's the same behaviour. Do you know what I mean? Blanche is dressing it up as... Um, all like literature and you know all clever and poetic but it's still the same inappropriate behavior and i think that's what williams maybe wants us to consider well you do honey lamb come here come on here like i told you i want to kiss you just once softly and sweetly on the mouth 
And then, so he does, without waiting for him to accept, she crosses to him quickly and presses her lips to his. Run along now, it would be nice to keep you, but I've got to be good and keep my hands off children. So we see there the greed of Blanche, Blanche sorry, sexually, her inability to control herself. And also this idea that she's been warned in the past, I've got to be good and keep my hands off children. Doesn't that sound really inappropriate and worrying? And doesn't it hint at this darker side to Blanche that we perhaps haven't seen in full yet? And then page 58, it all ends with Mitch coming around the corner and she immediately drops back into this persona. Look who's come in, my Rose and Cavalier, bow to me first and I'll present them. And poor Mitch goes out on this date, which is going to be scene, scene six, which we'll do next week. So lots to think about there. I will set you an assignment. I'll set you a writing task on this uh, probably tomorrow. For now, just watch this video and um, you've already watched the video, obviously, if you've got to this point, but make sure you've made lots of notes on um, scene five. And then tomorrow I will upload the writing task um, that I would like you to do. Okay. Hope you're all well and good guys. And I will uh, hopefully see you soon.